I'll give it about a minute and a half, two minutes uh, until everybody yeah. comes in. I'll pause the recording while we're waiting for people and then just start once we pick back up. All right, so we're going to start the symposium right now. All right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Darius Holliday. I am editor-in-chief of the Journal of Race, Gender, and Poverty. Thank you for attending our annual symposium titled, Did You Really Just Say That? A Discussion of Microaggressions and Implicit Bias. The journal strives for membership as diverse as its title, which is derived from an attempt to be as inclusive as possible of ideas in its subject matter, while always embracing the background and interests of an ever diversifying student body. The diversity of the journal will continue to evolve with the assistance of the annual symposium dedicated to a different and unique perspective of the law and its effects on society. The journal intends to provoke critical thinking and discussion, enlighten the community, and most of all, serve as a reminder of the world's persistent injustice while encouraging the community to take a stand against those injustices. I personally believe that this symposium is important because we all have a part to play in in educating ourselves and others on the experience that we face on a daily basis. Whether it's in our classroom or in the court, um, we can all do a better job as individuals to make our safe spaces a lot more safer. Um, currently, I'm gonna give it over to Hong Vo and he'll explain more. Hong, you are on mute, um, Hong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so first, again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this year's symposium. Um, my name is Hong Vo. I'm the symposium editor for the Journal of Race, Gender, and Poverty. Um, for this year's symposium, I wanted to have an open conversation on a very prevalent issue that's always been around, but one that I've seen creep up a lot over the last year, especially during the pandemic. Um, so this year's theme is about microaggression and implicit bias, specifically racial microaggression. So uh, microaggression can be defined as a brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights or insults. Um, you know, we've all had someone ask us a question or say a certain remark to us that was quite questionable, and we weren't really, weren't really sure exactly how to take it, but you knew something was a little off about it. So that's just a very simplified version of microaggression. So for this symposium, my goal was to help others identify what microaggression is, um, how we can address it, how we can cope with it, how to recognize it, whether you're the target or you were the microaggressor. And um, lastly, what we can do as future policymakers, because this is a law school, um, in order to combat the issue through legislature. Um, our panelists this year, Attorney Burrell and Dr. Forrest Bank are specialists on the topic. And you know we'll all be hearing from them soon. Um, first, we're gonna ask the, the panelists some questions that I've written, and then we'll have a Q&A with the audience. So throughout the symposium, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A feature at the, the bottom of your screen. Um, and then the chat feature will still be there for open discussions and everything. But if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature. Um, next, we have Jonathan White, our moderator. Um, Jonathan is the former symposium editor, so he is my predecessor. So everyone, please welcome Jonathan White. Yes, thank you, Hung. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Hung said, my name is Jonathan White. I, I am a, a, an alumni, um, an alum, sorry, alum from uh, Southern University Law Center. I just graduated um, of May of 2020. Um, and also I am the, um, the former symposium editor of 2019 and, 20, and 2020 of the race gender of journal race gender, race excuse me of the journal and um i'm currently in the dmv area right now i work as an associate uh, attorney at ashcraft and jarrell and I, my practice is uh elder abuse of uh, nursing home abuse and um and also do I, I do a litigation with that as well so um i'm glad everyone's here in attendance for the symposium i'm very excited to be here i'm very excited to um, introduce our gracious um speakers uh, for our panel and the first person I wanna introduce right now is Ms. Latoya Jones Burrell. Um, Latoya Jones Burrell is the executive director of the Innocent Foundation. 
She leads and manages the activity of the foundation with continued involvement and support from the family. She's also Zenpro's global diversity, equity, and inclusion champion, working with leadership teams to help provide experiences and resources to advance Zenpro on its DEI journey. Latoya has extensive higher education and legal experiences and was previously Dean of Graduate Education and Accreditation for North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she was also an associate professor. Latoya um, has a Juris Doctor degree from Southern University Law Center, whoop, whoop, um, and a Master's in Business of Administration from Metropolitan State University. She's also a licensed attorney in the states of Minnesota and Louisiana, and has and a published author recently writing a book of Armenia's Racial Re Reconciliations entitled Be Bold, How to Prepare Your Heart and Mind for Racial Reconciliation. She is also on the Board of Directors, the board of directors for People Serving People, a Minnesota nonprofit shelter for families experiencing homelessness. And our next speaker is Dr. Sandra Forrest Bank. Um, she's an associate professor um, in the University of Tennessee College of Social Work and the director of social work office of the Research and Public Services. Um, she completed both her master's in social work and a PhD at the University of Denver. Her research is focused on risk and resilience and positivity youth development. She is especially interest, um, interested in the several forms of racial discrimination, um, for example, microaggressions, as risk and factors concern for youth who have already developed some problems by adolescence and enter the transition to adulthood as a disadvantage for every forever establishing state stability and well-being. Her interest grew out of um, more than 10 years of direct service as a licensed clinical social worker and administrator in the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center, adult adolescence outpatient community-based addiction treatment programs. There she observes a disproportionate number of people of color and programs often mandated through the Department of Child Services and Criminal Justice System. Dr. Forrest Bank has authored publications reporting both quantitative and qualitative researches, findings on deter uh, deteriorating influence of microaggressions on the well being of youth and young adults. She further conducted analysis to improve measure of microaggressions. And she's examined differential findings among various racial and ethnic groups. In speaking engagements, trainings, curriculum development, and university service, she provides a perspective and approach that aims to help um, white people understand systematic racism, implicit biases, and compel change to explaining how microaggression manifests from these mechanisms. So thank you for, um, thank you, uh, thank you for, um, both of you guys for um, attending this panel and wanting to be part of this panel. Thank you guys so much. Um, we're Southern University is is gracious to have both of you to spend your time and, and everything to join with us into discussion. So to start off this, uh, this, this uh, discussion about microaggressions, I want to um, just start off with personal experiences from, from both of you guys. So my first question that I want to give to you, and, and each one of you can uh, answer the first time, it doesn't matter. Um, can you explain, can you recognize when you were a target of a microaggression or have you ever um, been a microaggressor? And can you explain your um, experience with that? You want me to start, Chandra, or would you like to go? Either, either way, you can go first, go ahead. Wonderful, well, first and foremost, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure as an alum to return. And uh, not only an alum, but one of the founding members of the Journal of Race, Gender, and Poverty from the two, oh, 2007 and 2008 year, and I was the inaugural managing editor. So this is for sure a pleasure for me to be back here with you all today. To answer your question, have I ever experienced microaggressions? The answer is absolutely yes. I'm a black woman in America. I can think back to microaggressions that began as early as kindergarten. You know, I've been telling people lately that I've been doing microaggression a racial reconciliation and implicit bias type of training and work since I was in kindergarten. And I know that may sound far-fetched, but you know, when you really think about the definition of microaggressions, uh, if you think of the definition of even implicit bias, you realize that some of these things have been coming to you since you were a kid. So for me, born and raised in Louisiana, the colorism issues that come up, you are so pretty for a black girl, for a girl that color. You're, you know, you're so well spoken. I get to Minnesota in my adult years, and the questions that come are: What do your parents do? What does your husband do? What, you know, it's the perception that you're suggesting that for me to be in the space that I'm in, for you to look at credentials of JD or even MBA, the question is: Well, you must have been postured and set up in a different way 
Uh, and I use it as an opportunity to say, well, actually, my parents were 17 when I was born. I'm the first person in my family to go to college, let alone to get a JD or an MBA. And so people may not see it as microaggressions, but they, in fact, are uh, microaggressions. Uh, and, and I know I'm pretty sure that anyone uh, of color probably can relate, even if you don't realize that it's coming to you in a form of a microaggression. That was wonderful. I want to say thank you for having me here as well. This is quite an honor. Obviously, probably obvious to you that I can't speak from the perspective of a BIPOC person. Um, and some of you are probably wondering why I'm here. But what I do bring is I bring the perspective of a white cisgender Jewish woman who grew up believing that racism is wrong and that I could never possibly participate in it. And then I I had the painful experience of realizing my own role in systemic oppression and making the commitment to both the lifelong learning and challenging it however I can. Um, I think it really is important to maintain the focus on race and ethnic identity in this, but I do wanna to talk to, because microaggression can apply to all marginalized and oppressed populations, and I'm certainly aware of a reminded frequency frequently of the parts of my identity that carry reduced status. For example, as a woman, people are more attentive to the voices of men in the room. Men often think they can tell me what to do, what to think, own my thoughts, um, sexualized. And I've had a lot of, especially when my children were very young, a lot of people told me my place was at home and that I should stay home and not be in the workforce. So those are some experiences as a woman, as a Jewish person, I've experienced um, microaggressions for sure. Things, things like I was doing a fitness group activity and the instructor had everybody circle up together um, under Jesus, like to unite under Jesus. And that, that is a pretty alienating experience. Doesn't make me think that that's the place for me to be. Um, and then also sometimes things I'll see things like like the guy on January 6th wearing the Camp Auschwitz shirt at the Capitol. That truly is terrifying to see it, but it's it's much more shocking and less often for me. So honestly, um, I'll tell you right away too that I observe a lot of racial and ethnic microaggression whenever I talk about microaggression because a whole lot of white people who are usually my audience, usually more people are white who I'm trying to uh, educate about this, go straight to denying that microaggressions happen and defending their own actions or believing defiantly that they don't participate in racism. So I what I think is really most valuable for me to tell, tell you is that painful experience I had that was a turning point for me and what made me so interested in microaggression. I was teaching my first course as a PhD student um, it was a course about adolescent development. And I engaged the class in a discussion that was about different models for identity development. So there's a race, there was a identity development and ethnic identity development. And so we had a conversation and it went brilliantly. You, if you could imagine that the University of Denver a private university that I went to, the classroom um, was about 25 students and two of them were of color, um, two women in the room. So we had this conversation, it, everybody's participating. It's, it's, the best, it's the best discussion I've ever had teaching. I left there feeling like I could do this. And meanwhile, those two women went from my classroom to a meeting that was um, happened to be right after the class at the Shades of Brown Alliance group. And they found themselves really processing, feeling like they'd been tokenized in my class. And so then I had administrators come in a very, you know, kind of angry punishing way. And then, um, but then the multicultural expert helped me help come back to my class and facilitate conversation about it. And I'll, you know, I'll never forget what he said to me was uh, before going in there, he dropped a bunch of F-bombs 
And essentially what he said is he does, he doesn't, he didn't care. I do not care how you feel. This is all about the students. And that is very, it was very powerful experience for me. So then the class processed this discussion we had. Sure enough, the white people in the room, for the most part, they don't, they're, they think it's absolutely crazy. What a great conversation we had. Uh, and then the two women talked about what they experienced in there. The actual action that I had done was when I asked for people to participate in the conversation and I mentioned the ethnic identity development, I looked at them um, and I'm, I'm positive that's true. I definitely was hoping they would engage in the conversation and they did. And they were talking, they talked about how they, what they experienced was that they were there, it's like it's their job to teach. They said that their narratives that they hold for opportunities like this, experiences like this that they know will happen in their back pocket that they pull out and that they weren't even true. Um, this was seriously amazing learning opportunity for me, even though I, you, I couldn't talk about it. So shameful and painful for me. So I go back up to my office and one of the students comes um, up to make, try to make me feel better. She, you know, she wants to comfort me for, um, don't worry. I know you didn't mean anything, you know, and I'm, it's not her job. And I hope she wasn't worried about her grade. It was just this very, a really powerful experience for me. Can I add on to something that Chandra just stated, some of the things? So, you know, some, many things popped to my mind as you were speaking. Oftentimes you will hear people say, uh, as the giver of a microaggression, if you say you didn't mean it that way, is that what matters or does it matter how the person receiving it interpreted it, right? So I'll share two, two short examples as well, but I wanna point out often what happens when we're having these discussions, lately you've probably heard the term intersectionality come up and how people might talk about how different things intersect. So me being black and me being a woman, how might those things intersect? And I think that oftentimes what we do as human beings is you focus on the identities that impact you. So if I'm a woman and I'm black, I might focus on that as opposed to religious discrimination that might take place or discrimination based on ability or disability or LGBTQINA, you know? So I often say the good thing about this is when we have the work done around microaggressions or implicit biases or just racial reconciliation in general, a big part of it is self-awareness. So the work that you do personally for one topic may then have an impact on your awareness about broader topics in general. So the question was, have we received and have we given uh, been the giver for microaggressions? And I responded by saying my receiving, but I would be remiss if I didn't say my giving. So I had a situation that happened and it was very eye-opening for me. So one of my goals is to become an ASL interpreter. I am not an ASL interpreter. I do not speak fluent uh, sign, American Sign Language. Well, I was in a position one day where we had someone who was an ASL interpreter. I was doing a panel sort of like this one. And the interpreter came up to me and said, do you guys have a prescriptive panel? Because I would love to be ahead in, pre in preparation. And I said, no, it's we're going to go with the flow. And the interpreter said, oh, you guys use such big words. And I just wanted to be ready. And my response was, and I meant it authentically, because I, wanted, I want to learn sign language. I said, you're going to do fine. You always do. So when the meeting was over, this person who I believe to be a friend came up to me and said, I just want to let you know that you really offended me. And I was literally like, what did I do? I'm so confused. And he said, you disregarded me. And he said, and the truth is, there is a community of people that if I mess up, they don't get the message. And he said, with all due respect, you don't know ASL. So what you don't know is I've been messing up a lot lately. And that was really an eye opener for me because for the first time that I'm aware of, I was on the giving in, and I know that I didn't mean it that way, but in that moment, his feelings were valid, and I knew that I had to pay attention to um, 
to it moving forward. And then the second example may hit home for some of you at Southern University. This example happened at Southern University. I actually write about this in my book. So one of my really good friends who I met at, at Southern, he, we studied together. This was our first semester. And he is a black male from Atlanta and we had a white female professor. And he basically said to me, I don't know what she's saying. Like, I can't, I don't, I can't connect with her. And I said to him in a sarcastic way, she's speaking English. What are you talking about? And he was like, I have never had to deal with a white woman before in my life. And I said, you're from Atlanta. There are white women in Atlanta. And he said, yes, but I've never had to deal with them. And then he explained to me that his K through 12 education was all black and that he went to Morehouse and that post college, he worked in a black environment. And it was just a wake up call for me that we are not only on the receiving, but the giving and also. And so as I transitioned into higher ed, I knew that I was for many of my students, black, white, Asian, whatever background, I was their first black professor in many instances. So I would tell them the story that I just shared. And I say to them, I'm speaking English. I, despite the look on my face that you may see the rest in face, I am approachable. I want to see you succeed. And I think that that was a wake up call for me to just be able to call it out for what it is. Thank you for both for both of those, um, on your honesty and both of your personal experiences with um, racial microaggressions, whether you were receiving it or whether you were the one that were giving it out. We really appreciate your honesty with that. So now that we've talked about your um, both of your own experiences with microaggression. Let's talk about what are some strategies to help um, one to be more aware of if they're committing microaggressions to another individual or a group. I think it's. I think that it's important to first just really understand what we mean when we say microaggression. That in what the theoretical concept is about that it's a uh, you're. You know, I could have a terrible interaction with a, a jerk who assumes I'm a racist snob, but what, when I leave that interaction, I return to the privilege that's ascribed to white people that I inherited through generations before me. So it doesn't matter that, you know, it doesn't matter that slavery was part of my people's experiences or, you know, there's no, um, in the US I inherit the advantages that white people violently claimed, even if I wish I didn't. So for, to be, I think first, it's just really critical that we just, that we clarify that microaggression is something, is a connected, it's a form of, a, of discrimination because it perpetuates oppression by constantly reinforcing stereotypes and social constructions and reminding people of the place that people hold in our society. So when they, the, I think that in, to recognize them, to recognize them first, we go into the, into the situations with, you know, we may intentionally build our lens of understanding the power dynamics that are present in, in situations and tune in on purpose. And then from that lens, notice when they happen, they, they tend to create a discomfort and the tendency, therefore, is that we tend to move past them and ignore them and try to move past them. Um, so that's critical. Well, I'll go ahead and let you talk some now too, if you want to. Well, I think that for me, it will be simple. You just educate yourself about it. And so I, I like to use the example, anything that we want, we understand that we have to work for it. So if you decided that you wanted a high school degree, diploma, if you want a GED, a PhD, a JD, you have to put in the time and work. And so there are so many resources and trainings out there that are provided to educate us about microaggressions and exactly what they are and what they mean. So I would say the first step there will be to admit that there is an opportunity for you to learn, learn and grow in the space and then identify a training that you can either do independently or with a group, whether it be a work group, uh, you know, academic setting or uh, a family and friend group, uh, frankly. And, and I'll go ahead and, and responding to that, respond to, I see that there's a question uh, from a 
from an attendee. And the question is, how do you respond to microaggressions without seeming like an angry black woman or an angry black man? And I think that that's a, a great question because we know the stereotypes that are associated with us, specifically black women. And then also I'm gonna talk about current events. Ironically, as I sit a mile away from the courthouse in Minneapolis as the Derek Chauvin trial is going on. And if you've been watching at all, what you see is uh, George Floyd being painted as a scary black man, which I think is, is issues in itself because for so long, the angry black woman angry, scary black man stereotype has been pervasive in the United States. But I think that how you do that is you being aware of your response and your tone. And one of the things I say is, I'm not going to allow you, I'm going to quote our a former first lady, Michelle Obama, who says, when they go low, we go high. And I'm very cognizant of how I respond because of that. Now, one of the things I'll say in how you respond is, my method is I respond with a question. I don't say, I don't think I have the luxury as a black woman to say, what did you say? I have to be cognizant of my face, my tone and things like that. So I get passive on purpose and my approach is to respond with a question. Well, I'm sorry, Jonathan, can you tell me more? And I'm gonna ask you questions and I'm gonna allow you to realize that what you said wasn't okay without me getting out of character or running the risk of you associating me because of something that you did as an angry black woman uh, or an angry black man. Uh, right after George Floyd was killed, so a woman posted on social media who I don't know, it went viral. Ironically, she was from Louisiana. And she said, I have been quiet because she said, I've been a quiet girl, black girl, because I didn't wanna be viewed as the angry black woman. And she's like, no more. And that resonated with me so heavily because like the question that's asked by uh, attendee Philip Charles, I often found myself being quiet and suppressing my voice because I was worried about being viewed as an angry black woman. So your question is spot on. And, and to answer it again, my response is, to be ready for it. And I am intentional about, even though I might be feeling a different way inside, with a smile, I'm gonna ask you a question and ask you to clarify, what did you say? I really love what you said about how it's about the effort that you put in. So, and of course I'm, I'm focused on the work that people need to do um, to recognize and make change in themselves and then systemically also, but I wanted to talk about what we could, where you could start if you're a person who is trying to engage in this. And so first of all, you have to decide that you want to. But a, one approach is to kind of make a list and think about, um, think about the people who you're most likely to encounter in your daily lives, because those are the people who you're most likely to harm. You know, your colleagues, neighbors, new clients, students, what list would you make? You, you could think about who you, what you can see, like usually you can see race or ethnicity, some disabilities. Sometimes you can see gender, sexual orientation, aging, and think about what you can't see. Things like religion, gender, sexual orientation, disabilities, mental illness, and give each of those some thought. And then, and then really, a place to start is really just what are your own stereotypes and assumptions about about people with those identities. So, for example, start. I might say, I might think to myself, what are the stereotypes and assumptions about Asian people? And then, for, you know, first of all, that in itself is a social construction of race. What is it? What does it even mean, Asian? It's a a multitude of ethnicities are represented in that category. And to so to start to just really challenge how I even think about it, what do I really know? What are the assumptions that are likely to be shaping how I interact and treat people? What is the historical oppression linked to these identities? What is the What are the common microaggressions that they experience? And it's a lifelong journey that can start with this inventory and then go from there to prioritize what where you know that your biases are most likely to potentially do harm. So, which is especially in situations where you know that you're in a power, a role that has power, for example, in therapeutic relationships or as someone's attorney or a 
certainly as their teacher. So where, I think, you know, you make a great point. It's definitely a lifelong process. So I like to say any of the strengths tests I've taken, say learner is one of my strengths and I'm a lifelong learner. So mm -hmm. I believe myself to be very educated in this area. I wasn't born with that education. It's because it's something that I'm passionate about and I commit my time and energy into continuing to learn and grow in this space. So I'm constantly attending symposiums or presentations. I'm watching YouTube videos and TED Talks. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm reading the books. And I think oftentimes when a person says, can you give me some resources? Can you tell me what to do? Even if you lead that horse to the water, you can't make them drink. So I can give you all of the resources and I can tell you the books. I can give you the books, frankly. You have to then put in the work. And I think so often what people want is it to be this easy checkbox. I've, I've attended this symposium, check, I've done it. I've, I've taken this course, check, I've done it. When it's a lifelong journey and it's a, a process of continual growth and continual education. And, you know, if I can be a little blunt for a second, I'm going to quote Nicole Hannah-Jones, if you guys are familiar with the 1619 Project and Nicole Hannah-Jones, I had the, the privilege of hearing her speak. And she said, it's funny that Black people are expected to be the spokespersons and experts when it's on uh, racial reconciliation or bias in general. We are, you know, we're expected to be the know-alls. And she was like, or we're expected to be the person to come up with a plan to solve injustices and biases. And she's like, and frankly, that's not fair because we didn't create the problem. <laughs> so, you know, I say that in a way of, yes, I am a lifelong learner and I can continue to do the work, but we all have to be willing to do the work and do the education for ourselves. And as Chandra just stated, it's natural for you to focus on the issues that matter for you. So I may be a little bit more aware of, of issues around race, gender, and my interest is um, inequities in education, so specifically standardized testing and things like that. So I'm going to know a little bit more about that area area than I might about uh, other communities that I don't identify with. And the only way for me to get that is not for me to say to someone, I can't go to an Asian person and say, can you educate me? They, I can ask for resources, but I have to be willing to do the work and put in the work and time as well. Exactly. It's a life, lifelong lifelong experience and for white people it's about getting past that um that denial and defensiveness that and just accepting the responsibility that we where we have it's up to us just like what you just said we we need to use the power that we've been afforded that's ascribed to us however we can and we need to resist when we can and we also need to be conscious not to speak for for people about their experiences and need to be careful also not to call people out in in when there is a situation that comes up with a microaggression and you know sometimes sometimes a some you know that savior complex can happen too where you want to you recognize it you want to address it you want to make it better you want the person who is is the target to to feel better but you actually can make things worse if their coping strategy is please let this pass i don't want to deal with this right so you have to really be thinking about how your behaviors are going to impact other people and how your sphere of influence can be harnessed to make a difference. Thank you both uh, for those responses. Um, I liked, um, um, Attorney Burrell, I liked how you said that, you, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make drink and make, make them drink because I definitely um, see that in a lot of situations, you know, coming up in, you know, in the legal field and, you know, in my law school career, you know, with microaggressions and trying to educate people. And I think that's one of the problems is that, you know, you can give so many, so you give somebody so many resources, but they have to be able to, you know, take that in. And I want to go, I want to follow up with that a question. Do you find any other challenges to, um, 
identifying microaggressions on one-on-one situations or in groups or with other people? Do you find any other challenges with that? I guess if you want to call it a challenge, what I might say is that expectation, and, and Chandra just alluded to this a little, that expectation that we speak for all people. So I, I often say, I cannot speak for all Black women. I can't speak for all women uh, because my experiences may be unique. <clears throat> and this has actually been made evident to me. Like I, I give the example, I'm very close with my grandmother and she's a Black woman and we were raised, born and raised in the same town. Yet her experiences with microaggressions, her experiences with race, uh, racism, et cetera, are extremely different than mine because she can speak from experience of living through an era of desegregating, right? She can speak from experience of living through segregation. So I think that that is sometimes a mistake, the expectation that we speak for all people when that is not the case. It's not possible for us to do that. And it shouldn't be expected for us to do that. And, and this may be random too for me to add this. I think that we saw this happen with when um, Joe Biden selected Kamala Harris to be his running mate. And there was so much hate. There's no other words to put it. There was so much hate. And then I reflected back on when Barack Obama was elected as president. And I said, it's so funny because while I say we cannot speak for all black people, I noticed that in negative and negativity, we are grouped together, but in positivity, it's not the same case. So for example, with her being the first female and black and Asian, if you will, um, vice president in her, if, if it was something negative, then her skin is black, she's a black woman. But despite all of her identities and her identifying as a black woman in her success, there's the attempt to strip that away. And the same thing we saw happen with, uh, with President Obama, but that might be a segue, but Again, my answer to the to that is not generalizing us, uh, whether it be good or bad. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about my racial microaggressions in the workplace or, or, or academic setting. So my first question I want to ask is, how can a microaggression impact a student's academic experience? So students who don't feel like they're they're represented by the people who are in power, who don't who feel like their voice is not heard and talked over, shut down, um, or if they feel like the the instruction is not for them, that it's created and tar and informed by people who are you know are white majority. They're, you know, often going to lose engagement and shut down. They might be, they might have experiences that, you know, a lot of, like I was saying, a lot of microaggression times when microaggressions occur, the response is to try to kind of move past it and not, not address it because it's so uncomfortable. But so if you're a student and you have experiences like that and you, and you don't even have a context to go talk to other people who might have experienced it also, it's a, you know, school becomes a uh, environment that doesn't belong to them and that is not um, comfortable. You're afraid to talk to the teacher because you don't, you've heard some microaggressions and you think it, it even could impact your grade, you know, if they, if they have a reaction, which is a big part of the dynamic of microaggression is that being a recipient, you never, First of all, you're never even quite sure, often not even quite sure if you've ex that's what you experienced. Did they really just say that? What did they mean? You know, is uh is it just me? And then and then being faced with the situation of needing to be able to decide how to respond. So am I going to confront it? Daryl Sue would say it's a catch-22. Either I confront it or I don't. You know, and then there's um that's why a lot of scholars talk about microaggression being these subtle forms of discrimination being even more damaging than the more overt kinds because it's so hard to recognize and so difficult to navigate. No matter what you do, you're likely to have some uncomfortable situation. There's a potential for it to have 
actually damaging consequences? And if you don't confront it, are you just accepting it? Uh, are you, you know, uh, going to leave not even sure what to do about it? it if you, and then if you go up from there, if there's no mechanism in the school that is clear to everyone in, in that academic environment about what the mechanism is to deal with it when it does happen, then there's no resolution. So it can impact, in my, my own research, I found a relationship between the more microaggression someone, uh, young adults experience, the more, um, the less academic efficacy they experience. And I can, and that experience that I talked about from my own history, you can really understand how you would not, it does not foster someone's best it, best learning experience. And we all know that it's all about how much we feel like this is for me. Yes, this is my thing. These are the people who I want to be like. The, so, yeah. Welcome you to add me. In <laughs> responding to that question, I think that I would have a twofold approach. Number one, I can think about my own uh, upbringing, K through 12, predominantly white environments where if I'm quite candid, the population of black students, th this is another topic in itself where we talk about segregation that still takes place in the schools through honors and AP classes versus a traditional population. So I would commonly be the only black student in the classroom in the honors and in AP classes. Um, and I think that as you continue to get into a space where you are expected to be the advocate for yourself, so high school or even uh, college and professional degrees, and you are able to recognize when you don't see representation for yourself in the curriculum, when you don't see rep representation in the examples that are constantly used in the classroom, and what that can mean, and just even acknowledging one of the comments in the chat, when you feel like you, and, and I'm going to just use the exact example, if, if there's a language or even culture, cultural barrier, and you feel that that is an impediment that you are not making an, an impediment, but the instructor who the natural uh, power dynamics of the classroom are not fostering a safe and welcoming environment. If you don't feel like you can be your, your authentic self and speak uh, whole, wholly and not, and not being interrupted. But the second piece of it is me just thinking about the ability as a mother to have to be an advocate for my two black boys. Uh, so I knew this already, but someone pointed out to me, uh, so my own studies, ironically, when I was at Southern, my interest was in standardized testing and uh, learning disabilities. My law review article was on the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it relates specifically to learning disabled law students. And my findings for me just now with me having little boys who are in, who are in the K through 12 system is how I have to be an advocate for them and how microaggressions can play in because I give the example, my seven-year-old son is already over four feet towering, over four feet tall. And I say, you know, my dad is six, six, my husband is six, two, he's going to be a big boy. And then I think about the phenomenons of something as uh, blatant as the school to prison pipeline. And despite the education that his parents have, my husband and I, uh, both Southern University Law Center alum, but despite the education that we have, despite the environment that we have for him, when he steps out of our home and into the school setting, he's seen as another Black boy. So the microaggressions that may be uh, attributed to Black children in general, I'm having to be very intentional about, about it as a parent. Um, I'm having to be strategic about on the first day of school that apple that he brings for his teacher on the first day. I'm having to be very intentional about acknowledging special days for the teacher showing up for PTA meetings to make sure that that person knows that my kids don't fit the mold. But it's so unfair because I think about what about the other little brown and black boys who look like my kids who parents may not able, be able to be present for one reason or another, but the natural stereotypes that are attached to them and the microaggressions that are associated and how that impacts them from an educational lens and how that follows that child from K 
through 12 and may be a factor that causes them to not pursue uh, a higher education. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important what you're saying too, of, as you know, I think mostly about the higher education context, but understanding that students' experiences come from a lifetime of, of this kind of systemic microaggression, systemic discrimination that now there are, and you, you know, could have a whole range of different scope of trauma from everything from violent acts of racism to lot, to microaggression, to just not being represented in school or being punished, um, disciplined unevenly. The, I think when, you know, essentially when, when you get to higher ed that there needs to be kind of a, just like a top down, that same kind of commitment that that is that we're talking about it on an intrapersonal level or an interpersonal level is also this level of like what do you do from the organizational administrative standpoint you need to it needs to be intentional it needs to be a commitment it needs to come from the top down and all the way for, it really needs to come all the way from the university administration as and and hold people accountable and move you know, you can do that from just both directions, but you need to make sure at the at the classroom level, you need to make sure, or the unit level, you need to make sure students know that they will be heard and that there'll never be negative re repercussions for voicing their experiences or concerns. And when when they do, when, when a, someone voices a concern about a microaggression, there needs to be a response that is, I, I want to hear that. That's not okay. And we need to do something about it. Hear what they experienced and acknowledge it. It has, and encourage them to address it with the faculty member, offer to be with them if they're uncomfortable. Do not just uh, dismiss it or that same, that same tendency to try to avoid dealing with it. Deal with it head on. Thank them profusely. This is a, an opportunity for us to all have a learning experience about it. And, uh, you know, make sure the faculty knows too, this is an expectation that we're all going to, to be addressing this, that your voices are not more important than the students. That was a really incredibly important learning for me. And that, you know, I was going to mention that the the kind of thing that may, gives me the most discomfort is when administrators will tell faculty to you know, keep the door open when you're meeting with students as though the expectation is that students make things up and are automatically in the wrong, disempowered. You know, leave the criminal, criminal investigations to the police. Tell faculty it's not appropriate to treat students in inappropriate ways, harass them, um, belittle them, and treat them differently than other students and teach them how to create and at the same time teach, have the expectation that, and mechanisms for instructors to engage in the learning. So teach, there needs to also be a process. Yes, you can lead them to water and, but also require it. You know, we're, we have a, it's in our college policy, our, it's in our mission statement, it's in our strategic plan that we're making these changes. We know that there's, you know, not enough diversity Students have had these experiences because we've asked them and we're going to do something about it. And, it's, and you know, especially teaching teachers how to manage the situations that come up in the classroom. You know, you can't, you, we all should want those situations to use those situations to learn from. You know, that we are going to address them. We're gonna, we're not gonna go past them. We're gonna take pause and we're going to, you know, learn from it. You know, I think that's great. And you maybe didn't notice, Sandra, but I apologize. You, I froze up for a second, so I interrupted you briefly. So I apologize for that. No, you're fine. But uh, I think that to add on to what you're saying, it's not uncommon for us to hear of K through 12 school educators having to be trained on cultural competence or sensitivity. And under that umbrella normally falls microaggression training, implicit bias training. 
But I think that there needs to be a practice where that is not only being done on the K through 12 level, but also on the the bachelor's level or the professional degree level as well, uh, because we do see issues with that. And I know oftentimes college courses or even uh, professional degree courses are evaluated, right? <laughs> but the question is what's actually being done with the feedback? And maybe add in, in addition to the course evaluation, just pulse surveys. You hear, or you hear often of corporations who do pulse surveys to their workforce to see how they're feeling about certain topics. But maybe it will be useful for universities to incorporate in surveys to hear from the students, not just specifically about a course, but the entire climate or environment and, and give them the opportunity to feel that they can be heard. Yeah, I really agree with that. And then also have space for, you know, so when you make that demand that there's a, we're going to measure this, we're going to, you know, intentionally develop strategies and accountability for addressing it, then you also have to have the this infrastructure and strategies for built into what you provide also. So, and again, and not just trainings, like here's here's what it is. Oh, yeah, another um, diversity training, but instead, you know, walk people even through the process, have a way of assessing where, you know, for, for, people, for the faculty or teachers to be able to assess for themselves where they're at in their own, this own journey that everybody's going to commit to. And, it, you know, for one thing that our, our school is doing now that I think is really powerful is having a space for faculty to bring the things that happen together. So again, it's like, a, these things happen. We all participate in it. We want to change it. So it's not about, you know, making a laundry list of microaggressions that you'd better not, you, you, you'd better not perpetrate. It's about in, engaging in this whole process and expectation culture together that we're all, you know, oh, that, that came up. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to learn, you know, confront this thing about that I didn't realize about myself and then discuss it and problem solve together with other teachers and faculty how to problem solve it and plan because you can also you need you can really really build an understanding a recognition of what kinds of things are going to come up and plan for them you can know when there's going to be you know diff you know especially in, in things like law and social work you know there's going to be ethical dilemmas and um and things that come up about racial differences, cultural differences, then you can, you know when they're going to happen. So, so be planful for it. it, you know, integrate the learning about that into, into those, that uh, curriculum. Thank you, Gav. Thank you both um, for your answers. Um, I think that um, I think it's great. I think um, Dr. Um, Bang, I think you touched on a lot of things. Well, with my next question about how does um, the faculty and the staff address these microaggressions? Because I know in certain instances, some students might feel like, you know, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm playing the race card, or I don't want to, or I don't feel comfortable enough to, you know, bring this up because I feel like it, it, it might not be seen, it might be like a, a minute situation that a faculty or the administration might not want to address because it's just so small. So how can we give the courage, how we can give students the courage to come to, to the faculty and to the staff to address the microaggressions and how should staff and faculty and, and administration at these um, universities and school, you know, deal with it? I think you have to be intentional about it. So there has to intentionally be trainings for the faculty members that may even extend the students. Uh, and I think also processes help. So if you know a defined process for, if you have a complaint or a grievance, this is the process that's gonna be followed. To me, that helps uh, there not be any question about where do I bring my grievance and what's gonna be the process. So should I expect to hear a response in two weeks? Should I expect to hear a response in a month? So the more intentional and the more, uh, specific you are, I think that that will be what's necessary. And that expectation that you will, like, you know, this is part of this learning thing that we're in, we're in it together. And so 
you know, it's not your, it's, it is, we want to be able to confront those things with faculty and for faculty and teachers to learn. So to definitely have the mechanism. It's the same thing that applies to work, you know, workspaces too. Like you have a policy, something happens. What do you do first to address it directly with the person? Bring it, you know, if that doesn't get resolved or if it keeps happening, it goes to the next level, have it really clearly spelled out what those what the policy and protocol is for it so there's and then students are oriented to it also have spaces that found and that is what we keep finding is how it's so important is there needs to be um spaces for people who share similar identities to have safe spaces so we have you know um like I was saying in my doctoral program that Shades of Brown Alliance, and now we have a coalition of black social workers and a Latino coalition for social workers and a LGBTQ. And those, especially those last two are fairly new and it comes from it being so successful to have, have that space for there's, you know, power and collective um, energy and, and there, that, once you you can have a place to go process talk talk about it develop a plan and then hey, how you want to come back and, and approach it collectively is another mechanism that can be built in and be very powerful thank you thank you so much for those suggestions so I want to go into microaggressions in the workplace. So how can um, how can microaggressions affect um, a, impact a person um, in their work life, and also how can they deal with those microaggressions, and how can they confront them within the workplace? I think that in a workplace, that's an interesting question because it depends on so many things. It depends on your level in the workplace. It depends on the culture in your workplace. It depends on who is give, the giver of those microaggressions. What if it's my supervisor? What if it's you know someone who is a, a rainmaker, if we're gonna specifically talk about law firms, right? And I don't feel that there is a structure or a system in place for me to be able to speak up about it. Uh, it, may, it may impact my job and my ability to continue to function. Um, however, I think we see it play out because if not addressed, that person will either, two things will happen. Number one, they're gonna to continue to work there and it may impact their performance adversely. Or number two, they will exit and they're gonna leave and then the cycle will continue. I know it may not be directly a type, uh, attributed to microaggressions, but we often hear, especially in the legal uh, setting, the idea of the representation of people of color in law firms and the lack thereof. And then they talk about the pipeline. And there, you know, is there a pipeline? And then the studies begin to shift to, well, there's a pipe, but it's leaky. So the Black people enter or the minorities enter the law firm setting, but we don't stay. And what's the reason why? And I think that a lot of it is attributed to if you feel supported, if you feel that you're set up for success, to be cliche, you have filled the pipe for diversity purposes, but your diverse candidates don't feel that they're being equitably treated they don't feel included and they don't feel a sense of belonging. And so what do they do? They leave. So with that, if we were to dig deeper, some of it may be directly attributed to microaggressions or experiences that they may have experienced in the workplace setting. Uh, there, there are so many studies that talk about it from a study that was done, I believe, by the ABA, where they, they used law briefs and they put a name that was a black sounding or ethnic name on it and that associate received lower ratings and the same brief was used and it was a white associate male associate's name put on it and it didn't get the same critiques. Uh, I think also we see when you talk about microaggressions, I know I've had it happen before. My name is Latoya. I don't think my name is hard to pronounce, uh, but I've been called other things besides Latoya and I used to just not respond to it. Uh, but then I finally got to a place where, where, cause it's awkward. How do I respond and say, oh, actually my name is Latoya without seeming like it's uh, a aggressive response from me. Um, but it, this, this all stems back to even the hiring process. I remember specifically being in law school 
and having a classmate who name is ethnic sounding. And uh, she told me that she was considering doing two things. She was considering not using her first name, using her first initial middle name and asking me would I ever do that? So my middle name is Michelle. So she was like, would you ever consider using L Michelle? And I said to her, you know, no, I, I wouldn't because I don't want them to expect L, whatever they expect L Michelle to be. I don't want them to expect that to show up. If you hire me, I want you to know that you're hiring LaToya and any stereotypes, good or bad, that you might have about LaToya, I want that to show up with me on my first date. But then again, stemming beyond just names, this same friend was engaged at the time. And she told me that, and this is illegal, by the way, she talked about how she felt that her engagement ring was causing questions about her interest in starting a family. Because the presumption is, you're going to get married and then you're going to want to have babies and then you're going to take off time to do that. Right. Uh, so there are so many microaggressions that come in the workplace to answer that question, Jonathan. I think that it's easier for us to if we were to narrow it and talk about specific ones and how they show up in the workplace. So many ways that um, it gets communicated through microaggressions that you just don't you just don't fit in, you're just not cutting the mustard, you know, you're not, and they're, they're subtle, but they're, especially when you come to a place and it's all about, uh, you, you know, trying to establish your career and grow and you're finding that there's not room for that, that other people keep getting advanced ahead. And um, there you, a lot, having talked to some of my my colleagues of color about their own experiences, you know, it's like I'm the the middle tier now. There's a senior, and then there's the new people coming in, and it's a uh, they've had experiences where they were tried to address things that they knew were being were being discriminatory, and then from there there was a reaction that shut them down, and then everything was a a different measure than anyone else, and. So the way that it can impact people is it can keep people from growing, from feeling like they belong. Yes, absolutely, leaving or uh, never, just not realizing potential and growth. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate, we appreciate those answers and those um, to these questions, we really do. So we like, so I know in the workplace, sometime in the workplace we, Sometimes we might be stagnant. We cannot figure out what to do, you know, when we're dealing with microaggressions. And, you know, it might be it might be a situation where, you know, at this time, at the place that you're in right now in your, in your career, you might just can't address it as much as you want to because you're trying to move up upward lateral and whatnot. So what are some coping mechanisms um, for those who are targeted from microaggressions who, who just feel like, so what, what can we do to cope with it? Or what, what can we do to to solve it or to make it to, to make it less of a sting. Um, I'm just going to say that just being intentional about what they about coping mechanisms is probably a, you know the strongest recommendation I would have. You know that you're you kind of know what what works and for you and can employ those strategies when they when those situations do occur. I think that oftentimes, and this this was mentioned earlier in, in the corporate setting, they're, they're known as ERGs, employee resource groups. In educational settings, it may be affinity or related organizations. Uh, and oftentimes those are safe spaces. And for some people, it may be relatives who you feel comfortable. I don't wanna use the word complaining, but you complain to them in a safe space and you may be more vocal and passionate. Uh, and that's your way of getting it out, getting advice and determining how do you address the situation head on. Uh, I think the issue with that though is, however, it's only a Band-Aid fix and it doesn't really uh, fix the problem itself. Uh, I think that for me personally, the response is you cope with it by you figuring out what your plan is gonna be when it happens. So again, like I said, my practice is I respond to microaggressions with questions. Can you help me understand? Can you please tell me more? Uh, and I'm very cautious about how I ask those questions. And that's to also respond to one of the questions. How would you respond to microaggressions that are included in annual evaluations? I would do the same thing there. I would ask a question. 
And instead of it being a defensive or even um, hostile kind of a response, I will be very specific and I will say thank you so much for the feedback and evaluation. I am always looking for the opportunity to continue to grow. And however, I do have a question about this thing. Can you please expound more? Because I want to make sure that I'm using it best uh, to grow. And in that way, you're flipping it over and putting it back to them in the form of a question. And that might allow them to realize that hmm, maybe rewording should happen, especially if it's an annual evaluation that's going to be in your file and that's going to follow you. I would definitely uh, not just let it fly. I would I would be very intentional and strategic and specific about how I respond and question it. Thank you for that. Yes, I can. Um, I know at uh, where I'm working at currently, we have a like a group, like a I, I want to say like I want to say like my, not a minority group, but we have like a group of people that call that at work at my law firm. We have a group that we meet every week and we just discuss, you know, just in general, like you know microaggressions in the world, you know, just, just in, in general, just, you know, just being, you know, being a minority in the, in, in this in society, but we also some, some work things might come up too. And I feel like that is a, a safe place for me because I know that, that it's not going to get out. And I also feel like, you know, oh, I'm not the only one experiencing this too, you know, cause you know, sometimes I feel like we, we feel like, oh, we're isolated. Like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling this way. So it's just only me. So I shouldn't say anything, but both the times a lot of other people, you know, in, in the same environment, I've experienced the same thing. So those groups are very helpful. You know, so. it's funny that you say that. I remember when I was in law school and I was summer, summering for a law firm in Atlanta and the law firm, like many law firms had a black employee network and they had a picnic that summer and they invited me to the picnic and it was me and one other, my black summer associate. And the discussion at the picnic quickly went left and it turned into a complaining session from some of the more senior associates. And I'll never forget one of the partners said, uh, like, you know, it was kind of like, oh, don't forget, we're trying to recruit them to come to the firm. And I remember having a chuckle and speaking up and saying, no, I am happy that this is happening, that you guys are allowing me to see that this firm, that people at this firm are human and not exempt from the things that have happened to me for my entire life. And it made the firm seem more real. Uh, and you know, just to, to see that come to life uh, and them be able to share those experiences. So I think we often, it, it's common to have that safe space uh, where you can vent and share and get words of wisdom from those who may have done it before you or, or maybe a little bit ahead of you on the journey. Definitely, yes, the turn word definitely those safe spaces are, are very, very important. So we, um, in, in closing into um, our symposium, um, before we do our Q&A from our attendees, we're gonna, I want to go and talk about policy and legislation when it comes to microaggressions. So um, much like the Crown Act in California that prohibits workplace discrimination against hair, which was, you know, was in place specifically for Black women, um, can we enact similar laws and policies throughout the country to combat microaggressions in the workplace or in the academic setting? I think you can, you absolutely can. I do tend to think that those uh, laws need to, you know, happen at, um, well, I, I think that having laws that require that there are these mechanisms, you know, once, once we start saying we know that these, that these mechanisms are what work and what make people um, have more positive and equitable experiences, then we need to create policies that require them. So, but I don't have any, um, when I'm thinking of, go ahead, I'll let you, it, it makes more sense for you to answer the law question. I'm gonna let you do that. No, for sure. I, I think that you are certainly qualified and el eligible to speak on this topic as well. And Jonathan, before you even said Crown Act, when you started the question, the Crown Act immediately came up to my mind before you even said it. And I think that that's a prime example of how as we are progressing and advancing, we will see legislation come out for some of these areas. Now, Again, like I said, I've, I've written before on the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that, might, that may seem, my, I know for me, it's mind boggling to think that there were not protections for people with disabilities until 1990. And it's also mind boggling for me 
that we had to actually get legislation in place to protect people with disabilities because they were not being treated accordingly. And then it, it's even more mind boggling for me that 18 years later in 2008, there had to be an amendment to the Americans with Disabilities Act because despite the legislation, there was still courts that were interpreting the words to not be as inclusive as intended when the, the act was uh, enacted in 1990. So what I think is interested, interesting is in 2008, when the Americans with Disabilities Amendment Act came out, this is how I say it in my, uh, my summarization. I say, they respond and say, no, actually that is what we meant. So let's be very clear. And then they go and define terms for us that were already included in the definition in 1990 to specifically say to the courts, you got it wrong. So we don't wanna give you room to interpret. We're gonna be very clear and tell you what we mean. Now, what I expect to see happen is legislation like the Crown Act, there being space for misinterpretation. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's odd. I was having a discussion with someone about the Crown Act and that person said to me, I never knew that it was that big of a deal and said to me, but you don't, that doesn't apply to you, right? And I said, well, tell me more. Why don't you think that applies to me? Don't think that applies to me. And that person said, because your hair is always straight and neat. And literally my response was, do you have an hour for us to go through why my hair in your mind is straight and neat? Because that's not the way it grows out of my scalp. And I've been condi conditioned by society to think that this is the only thing that's acceptable. Um, I don't wanna call out any areas, but I will specifically, a parish in uh, Louisiana, not too far from Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish, received some attention. Not, it wasn't the parish, let me correct myself. It was a private school in one of the parishes not too far. And they had a letter that went out saying what was acceptable for the first day of school and the uniform pictures. And they specifically said, uh, that your hair has to be neat. And then they went further to define what's not neat. So it said braids and dreads and things like that that are heavily associated with, with ethnic hair styles. So, you know, I think that to circle all the way around, I think that we're gonna continue to see legislation like the Americans with Disabilities Act, like the Crown Act. And I think we're gonna see it uh, be more specific to point to things that have been known to be microaggressions. I, the only, the only thought I have to add to that is, and when we were talking before, it always, you're always the optimist, and then I'm always thinking about um, what we see in the, the pushback that every time we make progress, there's a backlash, and that, you know, for example, legislation that makes it harder to vote, um, and I, I guess I really just ex want to express appreciation I have for all of you folks fighting to change policy. Thank you, thank you. I, I just wanna say thank you to both of you um, for this um, amazing discussion we had. Um, thank you to Attorney Burrell and thank you to uh, Dr. Um, Bank. Thank you so much um, for your time um, and, and speaking with all of us. And um, and I wanna just really quickly, Attorney Burrell, I wanna comment on the, uh, the hair thing too, because I, I didn't know, you know, as a black male, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that applied to me as well, but I remember a colleague had told me when I was interning somewhere, I had cut my, I had cut my hair, I had like a low cut and they were like, oh, you have a more professional look now. And I remember, I, I remember I was telling them, I was like, oh wait, my curls weren't professional. I was like, what was so wrong about my curls? And I remember um, having a discussion about that. Cause I was saying, you know, you know, hair is hair, you know, it, it shouldn't, you know, I think whether I have a low cut, where I have a, or curly hair or whatnot, doesn't, you know, define my performance or my job, doesn't define who I am. And we had like a really, really good discussion about it. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't mean to think y'all like, oh, no problem. But that does apply even to, um, to you know, people, people of color in general. It, it, it actually, for men, it extends not just to the hair on your head, but it also extends to your facial hair. And I've heard the discussion about that as well. And I'm like, you know, it's so many other factors that come into it. And, and I thought about this more recently, it's not something I've embarked on, but I've even thought about the trauma that's associated as a black woman uh, to hair and how we're expected to show up. I know so many black women who before the whole natural phenomenon started to trend in the last 15 years or so, I know so many black women who would pass up on working out 
because they didn't want to run the risk of messing up that straight hair that they knew they had to present in a professional manner in a workplace because that had been defined as, as professionalism. And until this day, I know so many Black women who will go to get their hair straightened and will say, I won't be going to the gym for the next week because I don't want to compromise what I've I've gotten here. And it's just so unfortunate. And I mean, and this stems to so many things when we talk about the Crown Act and for those people who might think, you know, that why do we need something like that? I think about um, the doll experiment that was done for the first time, I believe in the 50s or 60s. And then it was reenacted around 2010 where Anderson Cooper from CNN reenacted it. And what the doll test does is, if, you, if you're familiar with it or not, I'll give a summary. What it does is you give it's behind like a blind screen. So you have kids, typically little kids, four or five, maybe six year olds, and you give them dolls. You give them different shades of dolls, different hair on the dolls. And you ask them questions about the doll, like which doll do you want? And overwhelmingly the dolls for the, um, if it was a white kid, the white kid will want the, the white doll that looked like them. And, but they would still not really have ever things to say about the other dolls, but overwhelmingly the black kids didn't have positive perceptions about the dolls that looked like them. And it was just disturbing to see the same results over 50 years later when that test was reenacted. And I think a big part of it is we, we see changes now of there being intentional shifts to have dolls that look like difference, differences, diverse dolls. Uh, and I think it's also ironic that I'll say this, um, I have in my office, I have three or well, four actually Barbie dolls in a box, the Inspiring Women series Barbie doll and dolls. And so it's Rosa Parks, it's Katherine Johnson, it's, um, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. And the point is, I had someone to ask me about those dolls at work. And I explained to them, actually, my husband purchased those for me. And it may not seem like a big deal that as a grown woman, the excitement for me to be able to say a doll that not only looks like me, but these dolls are spot on, like their hair, it's just everything about those dolls to me reflect a, a, who who I am. Um, yeah, it's Maya Angelou also in Ella Fisher. I was blanking on the other two, but that all stems to the Crown Act when people don't realize how deep the hair issues in our community stem. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go, I'm going to um, do a question from our um, question to answer. Um, somebody um, had posted a question. I'm going to read it out. And, and also, if anybody else was in our attendees wants to uh, do a question, please uh, type it in the uh, Q&A bar of this um, webinar. So this question says, um, as a white woman who deals with societal anxiety issues, I have butted heads with my male colleagues who would say microaggressions to me in a neurodivergent to a neurodivergent woman. When I was pointed out, they would not want to acknowledge it. Then when they pointed out, I said microaggressions to them, I acknowledge it and apologize. How do you deal with this level of complete disagreement and with the potential emotional damage you experience from this when you are doing the best you can? Oh, I wish there was a uh, uh, answer to that. I think that's that's why it's so important that, you know, that's why I'm committed to this and bringing this to um, to help people learn. But, you know, I do, I think that this is what I end up saying with to this is that people, some people just are not interested. They don't think that it applies to them. They think that they're not racist. They believe that with all their hearts. It's very, you know, that response of I'm so offended that you said that. And I don't, I don't think it's worth engaging them. You know, I think you, you let them know you don't agree and you dismiss, you dismiss their thoughts about that and more uh, and then focus more on the things that do come from, from top down, like whether you agree with it or not, you are responsible for demonstrating your what you actions that you've taken, your participation in these workshops, or um, you know, I'm I, I'm so focused on faculty because that's my frame of reference. But you you're documenting what your you know what your performance 
in that way and productivity in that way. And that I think um, it has to come from that direction and that you're, I think that's where it comes into where you are focusing more on being what, you know, not expecting something that's, that's likely to happen differently than you want. Doesn't mean you don't just keep trying and to develop, to advocate, but to keep butting against one person who, um, who you can expect the same response from is probably gonna end up in a situation where you are, you end up, damn it, you know, where you end up internalizing and and having some some um, impact yourself. So what do you wanna to add to that, Latoya? Yes, I would love to add to that. So first of all, thank you so much for that question. And I think to add on to what Chandra stated, I think that you will see that just like I say, we can't, I, I can't answer for all black people. I can't answer for all women. I think it's the same thing with this experience. You know, everyone is not going to be ready for the discussion. Everyone's not going to agree with you. And I think that you, and, and I had someone tell me this, a leader, um, when I had a situation with someone disagreeing with me, it was after the George Floyd was killed and the man was telling me, I didn't even know this man, it was on social media. He found me and was telling me that George Floyd wasn't murdered, that, you know, um, and so it just, it broke my heart. And I had a leader tell me, you give people one response. That's it. You're not, it's not your job to keep going around in circles with someone. Now I know it may be different because in this situation, you might say, well, this guy was a stranger for me and I didn't have to continue to deal with him. But what about if it's a coworker and someone that I cannot escape in this way? I would say at that point, you brought it up, you agree to disagree, and you don't have to continue to dialogue with that person about it. You do your personal work on it and they do their personal work on it. And oftentimes I say this, you may not see, and I, I use cliche examples. Like I say, you lead the horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. You may have led that person to the water and when they choose to drink, you may not be there to see it. Or you may have planted the seed in this person, but you may not see the flowers grow because someone else might have to come along and water it, but you've done your part, you've planted the, the seed. And so I often say that, you know, it's okay to disagree and this process is work and we all start this, it's a journey. We all start this journey at a different point. So just because you may be, uh, at a place of understanding and a willingness to grow, don't be defeated by the fact that that person may not have arrived to where you are yet. Uh, it's funny too, I I'll add this. When my book was first introduced for pre-sale, I had a lot of people who look like me reach out and was like, thank you for writing this book. Just based on the title, they had never even read the book because it hadn't been released yet. Uh, be Bold, How to Prepare Your Heart and Mind for Racial Reconciliation. They said, I'm gonna buy this book for all of my white friends <laughs> and coworkers. And I would respond to each person who looked like me who would say that, that's great. Thank you so much for supporting my book. But while you're at it, I encourage you to get yourself a copy too. Because as a result of history, the sheer result of history, there's work for all of us to do. And I think oftentimes we presume that just because a person is of a minority group who may have been known to receive these um, microaggressions and biases that we are immune from it. And we're not, we're human and we have biases also, whether they're implicit or explicit and we have microaggressions as well. So we all have an opportunity and space to develop, learn and grow. And I'll, I'll end this response to that question. And I hope we've answered your question uh, by quoting um, Isabel Wilkerson and the book Cast that a lot of people you know, know Cast from the last year or so. Uh, and she makes a comment, and I'm, I'm not quoting her directly, I'm paraphrasing, and she says, you inherit, when you inherit a house, you inherit all that comes with the house. So if you inherit, inherit a house that from the outside, you see the bones and it looks like a great house, but there are issues in a basement or the attic. She's like, that's your problem too, you inherit it all. And I think that that's how I think about, even if, and this is quoting my, myself actually, in my book, I say history may not be our fault, but making sure that there's a better future is our duty. Uh, I think with that duty comes us understanding that it's not gonna always be harmonious, understanding that it's not gonna always be uh, comfortable and just being willing to lean into that for whatever it means. Thank you for your answers. Thank you so much. I have another question um, from one of our attendees. 
And it reads, um, in the world of uh, DEI, with so many companies encouraging candidates to bring their full authentic selves, how do you work through showing up as that person and combating negative stereotypes and microaggressions? I can answer that, but if you, you want to go first, or you want me to go first this time, Sandra? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I think that my response there is the same. You, you be intentional. And I know I've had this discussion candidly with some of my girlfriends and we're like, mm, I hear you, but you will never get the whole authentic me at work just because of the history. So it's like, you say that, but do you really want me to show up with my curls? Uh, you say that, but do you really want me to not have to code switch? You're so used to the code switching. Do you really want me to use the same tone that I'm comfortable using with my family and intimate close friends? Do you really want that? So I know so many people who will say, I hear them. I know they say they want it, but until the company is able to show me more, I am just not willing to trust and do that. But for the person who might say, you know what, my company is taking strides on cultural competency and awareness. And I do believe that I can and I will bring my authentic self to work. I say to that person, you have to be intentional. When those negative stereotypes and microaggressions come up, whatever you determine is gonna be your intentional method, you be ready for it. And again, for me, mine is responding with questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a question back to that comment to the thing that you may have said about me authentically showing up uh, to work. I'm going to think it's a good place for me to end is that for, as a director and an organization that's part of a college of social work, but a, a bunch of researchers, IT people, still very, you know, predominantly white in the South. When, I, you know, I have brought the microaggression training to my staff and emphasize a lot about what the university is doing in the college and making things available and requiring it in the performance evaluations that there's goals about it. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that my job is to prioritize that over the reactions that the white people have because of my position of power. I need to be able to be willing to take those risks, try to, you know, emphasize this is what our culture in this organization is about. It's about making room for growth. It's about inclusivity and valuing, you know, what everybody brings. And, but what I do end up facing a lot is the pushback. So there's a lot of people who do really uh, start their journey. Like you said, there's different places on the journey, but there's also plenty of people who um, are pushed back and are in denial and need to, Maybe they're just beginning and that's, maybe it's, I love what you said about planting the seeds and people will, you know, grow and it'll, it'll be the, cumul the cumulative experience of being introduced to the idea and being, you know, forced to face their own biases and recognize that it's causing, it's causing conflict, it's causing harm, that they'll eventually really decide, I better take a closer look at this instead of continuing to fight it. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Banks, and thank you, Attorney Burrell. Thank you so much um, for engaging this, this great conversation. Um, if, they, if there's any um, anybody else that would like to say a question with our attendees really quickly, um, I don't know, you can type it in, but if not, um, I just wanna say thank you for this this really wonderful conversation we just had. Thank you for dedicating your time and your knowledge to um, to the University Law Center. And um, I'm gonna give it back to Hung or Darius. Hey everyone. <clears throat> Hi everyone. So once again, um, I just wanna thank you all for attending our symposium today. Um, I hope you all got something out of it. Um, I especially wanna thank you, Attorney Burrell and Dr. Forrest Bank for speaking. You guys were wonderful. Um, thank you for speaking from your personal experiences and your expertise. And uh, thank you to Jonathan White for moderating. You did an amazing job of keeping the conversation going. And um, lastly, I just wanna remind everyone to follow our LinkedIn page. It's called the Journal of Race, Gender and Poverty. And um, just be on the lookout for our upcoming publication. We have, I think seven new articles coming out 
Um, the symposium is was recorded and it will be uploaded to Panopto and it will be uploaded to um, Southern University Law Center's YouTube page as well. So you'll be able to rewatch the conversation today. And again, I just wanna thank you everyone for coming and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Really awesome. Thank you guys. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.